colon cancer, just in terms of context, continues to be the second most common cancer killer in North America and the third most in Europe despite screening. Uh, the, one of the problems with current tools is patients don't often use them. Uh, in the United States, only about half of patients are regularly screened. Uh, and those that take different tools, the tools themselves don't work as well as they could. So there's an opportunity, in fact there's an imperative to innovate with a test that delivers three things. One, high sensitivity for early stage cancer and the advanced precancers that are going to go on to cancer. Second, a test that's user friendly, that patients are willing to use, that doesn't interrupt with their daily activities. And thirdly, it would be easily accessible. A test that goes by the mail is, a, is an easily accessible test. So, Stool DNA testing actually is quite revolutionary. It meets all of those three points. Right, yeah. so, so it meets mm -hmm. those yeah. points. Mm -hmm. Can you contrast it to the previous and existing techniques, yeah. uh, the bar from which you sure. will be raising? Sure, okay. Well, I, I mentioned that it's, it's, it sets a new high bar for non-invasive tests. I'll start by saying that for colon cancer, for curable stage colon cancer, that is stage one and two, the sensitivity in a multi-center study was 94%. It has the same sensitivity as has been reported for colonoscopy, but it does so non-invasively. Now, no other non-invasive test does that. FIT, uh, a cross-study averages about a sensitivity for curable stage cancer of about 70%. For the types of polyps that lead to cancer, for adenomas, it detects about 25%. For the other type of polyp that's premalignant, it only de detects about 5%. Those are called sessile serrated polyps. Now, th now, this is actually tumor DNA that you're testing for. Yes. Now, the stool DNA test sets a new high bar because it's much more sensitive than FIT. Uh, again, 94% for curable stage cancer, but for the polyps at highest risk to become cancer, it also detects those uh, polyps over two centimeters at about close to 70%, 65 to 70%. What sort of false negative rate do you get? You, 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 um, and false positive? Yeah, now the flip side of sensitivity is called specificity, and you want high specificity as well, and that means few false positives. If the test says it's negative, it's really negative. You don't want to miss lesions. If, you, if it says it's positive, you want it to be a tumor or a polyp, not something that is other. So false positives, um, if you look at how a test like this performs at one point in time, the false positive rate is about 10%. Fit, it's about 5%. However, FIT is done every one year to two years. This test would be done every three years. So if one divides the, you know, the frequency, false positive, the frequency is, or the, the false positive rate per year is about 3% per year, which is about the same as FIT. So programmatically, they have the same false positive rate. How do you counsel this DNA test being introduced and used then? What's your advice? Yeah. Well, it's very easy to be used from a patient standpoint. They can have the test at home, and there is no preparation, no diet or medication restriction. There's no bowel prep. It's very simple to use. You basically defecate into a bucket and send it back to the lab. Uh, so simple from a patient standpoint. The uh, barriers for its widespread use are, are more regulatory. Uh, this test in the United States was approved by FDA in, in late 2014, and it was at the same time approved for funding, for coverage, by our Medicare, our government insurance. So those two big barriers have been resolved. Uh, those ne the private insurers in this country need to approve it as well, and that's being done sort of as we speak. Well, doctors and patients, there's a need to educate them, uh, and I think they need to understand what the perform how, how this test performs, and one would need to share those performance metrics. When one looks at that, it sort of sells itself. Uh, from a patient standpoint, they have no problem taking a, a high-quality test that involves no bowel prep and they don't have to miss work. That's a pretty easy education thing. But what has to happen, I think, at the patient 
provider interface is they have to have an objective conversation about all of the screening options. This becomes part of the, the a legitimate part of options now in this day. It's a legitimate option. And so they have, physicians need to put that in context. You know, this, it has these performance characteristics, it's non-invasive. And already there's a lot of patients that have chosen to use this test when they hear that story. Uh, but it, it'll be an evolution. It's just starting. It's just out of the blocks now. And there's, there's an education process that's required.